So let's take a quick look and summarize what we've learned about E2 and E1 reactions and do a little comparison. And before we get started, I just want to remind you that E1 is all about the carbocation, just like SN1 was, and that's why everything down here is going to match up pretty well with what we saw for SN1 reactions. Uh, so first thing I want to look at is the substrate, typically an alkyl halide. Uh, for E1, given being about the carbocation, the more substrate carbocation was the more stable, and so tertiary was the best, followed by secondary, and again, primary uh, generally doesn't form a stable enough carbocation to react. Uh, as far as the base goes, uh, for E1, a weak base is okay. It's not involved in the rate-determining step at all, just like in SN1, a weak nucleophile is okay. Uh, for E2, though, because the base is involved in the rate-determining step, a strong one is required, just like in SN2, where a strong nucleophile was required. So that's one of your big differences between SN2 and E2. In SN1 and SN2, uh, you have a nucleophile involved. In E1 and E2, you have a base involved. Uh, but the one reactions involve weak nucleophile or weak base, and the two reactions, SN2 and E2, require a strong nucleophile or a strong base, depending on the reaction. Uh, move on to solvent effects, and I'm going to really kind of gloss over these solvent effects here. Uh, but one thing to note for E1 and SN1 as well, the solvent has to, has to, has to, has to, has to be polar protic. Water and alcohols being the most common by far. Um, possibly a carboxylic acid as well. Um, now for E2, I put a big fat preferred here. So, and polar aprotic, uh, generally uh, when your base is negatively charged, it'll react faster in a polar aprotic solvent. Um, but it need not actually be a protic. Uh, E2 reactions happen f just fine in polar protic solvents. Uh, again, generally with a negatively charged base, a little faster in a protic, but protic, a protic, whatever. Uh, it's going to work just fine either way. Finally, your leaving group trend is what, again, is the same. Uh, in this case, uh, OTS is better than I, better than BR, better than CL, and then a lot better than fluoride, which is actually a bad leaving group, as we saw for one of the exceptions in Zaitsev's rule for E2 reactions. Uh, finally, rearrangements. Uh, you only get rearrangements if you get a carbocation. You only get a carbocation in E1 reaction. So they're only possible in E1, not E2. Uh, and then finally, some stereochemistry things to worry about. Uh, and I want to just look at the anti-periplanar uh, requirement for the reaction for an E2 to happen. E1 does not have any such requirement. Now, there might be some stereoselectivity in which products you form, but here I really want to just focus on that uh, requirement of the reactant when the reaction happens. So again, for E2, you've got that hydrogen in the leaving group needs to be anti-periplanar. For the E1 reaction, no requirement whatsoever. Uh, the hydrogen and the leaving group actually are involved in two totally different steps, and there's no requirement between them whatsoever. So if you've noticed here, the single biggest difference between E2 and E1 is going to be all about the base. Strong base for E2, weak base is generally okay for E1. That'll be your single biggest difference. The substrate differences are minimal. Uh, the solvent differences, protic versus aprotic, is not going to be as big a deal as you think because we do E2 reactions in protic solvents all the time. Um, the leave group uh, trends are the same as well. So, But that big difference really is going to be about strong base versus weak base, E2 versus E1. So now let's predict some products here for elimination reactions. And in this case, we're going to predict the elimination products. Uh, if you look, a couple things you should look at. Your substrate here is a tertiary substrate, and that's not really going to do us any good. And in this case, for E1 and E2, again, the substrate usually isn't your distinguishing factor. Uh, but your base here, water, is weak, and that's going to head us in the direction of an E1 reaction. So E1 reaction, the first step is leaving group leaves, and you form a carbocation. And, and again, I highly recommend you draw that carbocation out for E1 reactions just to make sure it's not going to rearrange. And in our case, it is a tertiary carbocation, and for the three adjacent carbons, none of those three would be better than that tertiary carbocation, so no rearrangements to worry about. Uh, those same three adjacent carbons are going to be our beta carbons, though. So, and in this case, these two beta, the two secondary ones here, are equivalent and will lead to a product. And then we've got this primary one out here. So we've got two different sets of beta hydrons possible to deprotonate then, leading us to two regioisomers. So we can form the alkene here. And again, had we formed it either here or here, it's the same thing. But we could also form the alkene with the beta carbon, uh, the methyl group that was out there. And so we get these two regioisomers, and it turns out neither one of these is capable of cis-trans isomerism. So the one on the right has two identical groups on this side, but it also it turns out the ring has two identical groups on that side. And again, any alkene with two identical groups on either side of the alkene, uh, there's no such thing as cis and trans. Uh, and then this guy, it turns out in a small ring, you have to have at least an eight-membered ring to have a trans double bond, so this one's definitely going to be cis. Uh, so not even possible to get trans. Uh, and so in this case, two different regioisomers, but no stereoisomers, just the two products. 
Uh, Zaitsev's rule will be followed for E1, so your more substituted one here, the Zaitsev product would be major, and your Hoffman or anti Zaitsev would be minor. All right, in this reaction, we've got a primary halide, and that might actually tell us something in this case. It's usually the base that's going to distinguish things, but in this case, we can't even do E1 from the look of it. Uh, but we'd figure that out pretty quickly, and again, our biggest distinguishing factor here is going to be the base. And when you see oxygen and, and potassium, potassium is a metal, oxygen is a nonmetal, and that's an ionic bond. Potassium positive, oxygen negative, and negative on oxygen is a strong base. And more so in this case, you should know that this is also more specifically a bulky base. Uh, and in this case, this is definitely going E2. Uh, in this case, there's your alpha carbon. The only beta carbon we have is this one. So we can only form the alkene in one location. And that would be right there. And with this alkene having two hydrons attached to identical hydrons, I should say, just to be clear, clear here, uh, two identical hydrons on that side of the alkene, cis and trans or E and Z is not even possible. This is your only elimination product in this case. Okay, in this elimination reaction, we've got a secondary halide, which tells us nothing. And again, our big distinguishing factor is the base. And here, sodium being a metal, oxygen a non-metal, this is an ionic bond. So, and again, we've got a negatively charged base. This is a strong base, and therefore, it looks like we're probably doing E2. Uh, if we look, there's our leaving group. So there's the alpha carbon. We've got a beta carbon right here and a beta carbon right here. This one does not have any hydrogens. So we don't have to worry about trying to form the alkene over there. With only one beta carbon where the alkene can form and it's got three hydrogens, we are going to get one single regio isomer. So looking like that. And cis and trans don't even exist because uh, one side of this alkene is bonded to two of the same thing. Uh, so in this case, you get one regio isomer, a single product, no major minor here, just a single product. Okay, here we've got a reaction with a secondary halide. And again, that doesn't really tell us anything. Uh, but if we look at our base here, this is an alcohol, and an alcohol is a weak base, and that's our big distinguishing factor here. Looks like we're going to be doing an E1 reaction. Now, if we're doing an E1 reaction, again, I highly recommend uh, that you first show your carbocation just to check and see if it's going to undergo rearrangement. So in this case, after the bromine leaves, we'll have a carbocation right there. It is a secondary carbocation. If we look at its two adjacent carbons, that one and that one, this one's primary, but this one over here is actually quaternary, and we definitely have a rearrangement in the works here. So in this case, we can't do a hydride shift. This quaternary carbon doesn't have any hydrons, uh, but we could do a methyl shift. So and reattach a methyl group uh, on that formerly secondary carbon here. So in this case, we've transferred a methyl group to that carbon, so this carbon now only has one methyl group left. Uh, this carbon right here no longer has a charge. It also has a hydrogen. It's had that hydrogen the whole time. But it's this carbon right here that now is missing a bond and only has three and is our carbocation. So and in this case, we went from a secondary carbocation to a tertiary carbocation. And none of the three adjacent carbons would be any better than that. So this is done rearranging. So there's our rearrangement. So incidentally, that is also our alpha carbon. Our beta carbons are the three adjacent ones we've already kind of highlighted here and they're all different. So we've got three different regio isomers we can form here. So uh, I'm gonna start and kind of do this uh, starting with Zaitsev. So notice this beta carbon over here is tertiary, this one's primary, this one's secondary. So Zaitsev would say start with the tertiary. That'll be where the major product forms. So, and in this case, we'll get this guy right here. And with these two carbons on the outskirts of the molecule, both being methyls, so that means the sp2 carbon here on this side is bonded to the same thing. There's no such thing as cis and trans, but this would be your major product. So next, I'm going to move on to the secondary beta carbon over here, and we could form the double bond right there. So and in this case, uh, both sides of the alkene have two different things, and so cis and trans or E and Z are going to be possible in this case. So we're going to get both. So I'm drawn one there. I'll leave this side of the alkene alone, but I'll have the hydrogen and the methyl group trade places. And so we'll get this one. So uh, this one over here is the E isomer. This one right here is going to be the Z isomer, and you get them both. They'll both be minor products in this case. And then finally, I'll use this primary beta carbon and form the double bond right there. And in this case, uh, one side of the alkene, in this case, this sp2 carbon right here is bonded to two identical groups, in this case, both hydrons, so cis and trans are not possible. So in this case, we got one major product, one Zaitsev product, and then these would all be considered Hoffman products of sorts and would all be minor products in this case, but four total products to predict for elimination.